obviously there are some really positive ways that social media has really brought to light what's happening in Ukraine. You think about President Zelensky's own videos he's taken on the ground and the, the attention that's captured across the world. So how do we think about social media in this war? It is, I think, in many ways comparable to the revolution we saw with cable uh, television covering the, the the Gulf War, the first Iraq War back in the early 90s. This is the first sort of classic traditional war in a sense. We have had other conflicts, um, sort of asymmetric wars, where we've seen an explosion in social media coverage. But this is the first time we're really seeing a traditional warfare play out on social media. Now, the problem is that you don't know whether you're getting the full picture. You don't know whether you're just getting snapshots. It's quite hard, you know, individual events you might see, but you're not necessarily getting the full context. So there's a huge amount of value to it, but you're not necessarily getting the 360 degree view that traditional media outlets might at least aim to provide. Parmi, I want to bring you in here because this is, of course, not the first time we've seen misinformation spread by Russia, particularly on social media. What do you think is the biggest difference between what we're seeing now and what we saw play out throughout, you know, the elections here in the U.S. and also throughout the pandemic? Yeah, that's a great point. Um, misinformation and disinformation on social media is nothing new. Um, what's really different now is just the speed at which this kind of disinformation, um, scammy content, um, misinformation is proliferating across these networks. It's Everything is so fluid right now, not only with the invasion itself, with the kinetic um, attack, but online, um, everything that's happening in terms of all the different outlets that can be diffused to, it's, it's moving much more quickly than before. So when we think about the fog of war, this is literally the fog of war at high speed. Um, and it's much harder now, I think, for social media companies um, to keep track of that. They're really in a, between a rock and a hard place, in a sense, because you know, Facebook and Twitter are outlets for Russian citizens to um, you know, see something different to the propaganda that they might get from Russian state media. But at the same time, um, those platforms are well known for having been misused by, you know, by uh, all sorts of actors to spread disinformation. You know, we've been talking about the important role of social media in some ways, but the misinformation in others. Alex, how do you start to look at where the gatekeepers are? How does a consumer know that what they're watching is legitimate or a fundraising campaign that they're giving to is legitimate? I mean, it's all about trusting the sources, and that's always been the problem with social media and news coverage more broadly, that you don't necessarily... That all sources are valued in much the same way. There might be a blue tick next to some, which helps, but you know, knowing that this is from a reliable source or that a reliable source that you trust and have good reason to trust has vetted this and said, we verified this video, we know that it was in this place, we know that it was at the time. We've seen outlets like Bellingcat, which emerged over the course of the past decade and has really made a name for itself in the way that it covers Russia. It is uh, essentially... a, a amateur news gathering, but they are incredible experts and they've developed expertise over time. They're very good at verifying, assimilating and, and collating uh, news, that's uh, information that's publicly available and verifying it. And so if you look to those sort of sources as well as your traditional news outlets, you're probably going to get a clearer picture. So given what you just mentioned, Alex, it sounds like it's more important than ever that these platforms allow information to get out from verified sources like Bellingcat, but at the same time, they have to limit the disinformation that's spreading. Parmi, is there sort of a, a tightrope moment that we're seeing these platforms have to walk, and how can they navigate this? Yeah, it's, it's very difficult, and it's the same tightrope they've been walking for years already with um, trying to be a, a place where people can get accurate information. Um, you know, Facebook has said that they've set up a task force to help Ukrainians um, you know, stay safe, stay, keep their information private on Facebook, but at the same time, they have also said that they've detected quite a lot of um, disinformation activity on their network. They've had to take down dozens of, of operations. Um, by disinformation actors. And so, you know, they're kind of trying to fight all sorts of different fires at the same time. And so much more quickly, again, this is really, I think, the difference now is about speed and velocity. Um, and that's going to take a lot of investment, I think, from the big tech companies, from the online players in particular, like Twitter and Facebook and YouTube, um, to make sure that they are fighting all these fires at the same time, um, while at the same time um, making sure that they, you know, they they could block access to certain um, channels and that is one thing that people have said that YouTube should do, a, a state uh, channel like RT for example or Sputnik 
Um, but then if they do that, then the, someone might play the censorship card and say that they are censoring these players. So it's, it's a very tricky balancing act.